Um, all right, so I think um, our panelists are going to kind of touch on some of the options, but we'll kick it off with a case discussion. Uh, so this is a 70-year-old gentleman that I saw who had uh, two years uh, of pain, uh, claudicatory pain, low back, buttock, bilateral, uh, lateral, uh, shouldn't say thighs, that's his calves, so in his bilateral lateral calves. He'd kind of gotten especially bad over the last six months. Um, he was having some back pain and leg pain that was generally worse with walking, limited walking tolerance, but he had some back pain while laying down as well. He tried physical therapy, he tried epidural steroid injections, uh, both caudal and transferaminal injections at L4 and L5, and had two days of relief of symptoms with both. Um, had uh, some oral medications, generally healthy guy, and exam was otherwise unremarkable. These are his pictures, so you can kind of see an L4, L5 spondylolisthesis, um, some degenerative disc disease at L5S1, um, pretty tall disc at L4, L5. These are his flexion and extension films. Um, you know, maybe some subtle angular change, but you know, I, and I measured this and not, not a significant change anyways from flexion to extension, so a, a stable spondylolisthesis. Um, and these are his MRI findings showing um, some uh, central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis at L4, L5. Um, his foram foramina look okay, so at L4, L5. He doesn't have really any L4 symptoms, but just for, you know, for completeness, it's not a significant component of foraminal stenosis here. So he, he has, I think, you know, principally my, my, when I was seeing this guy, kind of indicating him, like his main complaint, I think, is, is largely neurogenic claudication with some elements of L5 radiculopathy bilaterally. So I guess I'll open it up to the panel now and, and, uh, and ask how you might uh, approach this and, and we can just kind of go down the line. So we have a widespread uh, panel here. We have all the way Dr. Gupte who's a tubular spine surgeon and also we have Dr. Gautam who has performed P lifts also and T lifts also and MIS T lifts also. So let's start with Dr. Gautam. Dr. Gautam, is there any role of conserving this any further or surgery is really coming the way? So I missed the first part of the history, but just on the basis of the current, whatever he's put on there, uh, the patient's primary problem is leg pain, not significant back pain. Right. Uh, what I see is a stenosis at L4-5 secondary to a stable degenerative spondylolisthesis. There are coronally aligned facet joints. They are not sagittally aligned. For me, this is a patient where I would strongly think about a simple decompression without doing an fusion here. And if I'm doing a decompression, then I would do an over-the-top decompression. I would decompress from one side directly and then use a tube to decompress the opposite. Dr. Abhay, Dr. Abhay, can you put in on? Dr. Gautam already mentioned certain factors to justify his surgery because he's also worried that by doing only decompression in certain group of patients, instability may progress. What's your take so, on that? So, uh, for me, the covert sign of instability here is a tall disc and a pseudo bulge. So, I'm not happy to leave this alone, uninstrumented. I think um, there is a case to do a PLF alone, but I think I would cut the chase and just do a T lift. I mean, what, what, what would it take? So, for me, it would be a one level T lift, but I must say that at this level, most Indian 70 year olds opt for conservative, prolonged conservative treatment. They just live on injections and they just, they're just happy to live with it. And I must also say that you must aggressively treat his uh, osteoporosis, and that gives a huge mileage in his uh, symptomatology. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, we already have the box open now. There is a view of pure decompression considering some stability points and there is a view about doing t lift uh, in a patient elderly patient what's your take on that yeah i think in this case um you know what's interesting is the facet joint orientation coronal so i'm not as worried about creating in by only compression however i think what dr nene just said with regards to all disc that posterior bulge i worry. and also there's not enough central lateral recess I really think I would do an MIST lift to try to and really focus on uh, the spondylolis a little bit more height and uh, in this case because I think it would help with my team. Yeah, maybe I can just bring in Dr. Arvind Kulkarni who's present and published uh, extensively upon role of only decompression in stable listhesis. Which are the cases of spondylolisthesis where you will do only decompression? A general notion is that spondylolisthesis directly fuse them. But there are certain cases where only decompression works, like Dr. Gautam highlighted. Dr. Arvind, your take. Yeah, uh, I would decompress. I would do a uh, minimal decompression using the over-the-top uh, technique. 
So the things I would see is, you know, the alignment of the sits, the height of the disc in comparison to the shorter, uh, the facets are coronal, there is no facet effusion, facet effusion is sign of instability. I would see a uh, MRI uh, sag, sag in T1, and if it shows any hypo intensity in the disc space, that is a sign of instability, that is vacuum phenomena, can also be abbreviated in extension X-ray. I would try hard to see if any kind of movement is there between you know, flexion and so it could be a standing X-ray versus a lying down MRI, which should show that kind of a movement. I'm not be I'll not be bothered about the central disc because here we are following the L5 routes, which right uh, peripheral, not in the center. Uh, and uh, this is a very very wide lamina. So even if you cut, you know, about one uh, one fifth of the facet on both sides when you do a IPC and contralateral decompression, uh, uh, almost about 75 percent will be fa facet will be left intact. I don't, these are the signs I would look. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind, for mentioning all the points where, you, in which cases can you actually do only decompression where there are favorable points. So, Dr. Gautam, uh, are you not worried when you do only decompression that it may progress into a further listhesis? Why, wh what are the points against doing fusion as a blanket treatment in these elderly patients with multi-level degeneration? So, yes, uh, there is always a fear that uh, of decompression alone, the patient can progress further into a listhesis. But that's why I mentioned specifically that he has coronal facets. There is not much of a facetal effusion here. And therefore, the risk of progression of this into a significantly more listhesis is, go is less. Whenever you, there, I mean, there is nothing. As uh, Abhay said, what is there in adding a couple of screws to, a few, to do a fusion? Fusion is not something dangerous or something. But... Fusion comes with its own set of complications. When you add to any surgery, there is a significantly increased risk associated with adding an implant, the risk of infection, the amount of muscle dissection, the amount of blood loss, the amount of time taken. And when you fuse, there is a higher risk of adjacent segment degeneration also. So all these factors have to be considered when you're doing. If you, if you feel that by doing a surgery, additional fusion, you are able to give better 5-year, 10-year or 15-year outcomes to this patient, certainly you should fuse. But I don't think that is justifiable. So Dr. Too. Qureshi, there is, there is a paper which has actually compared vis vis pure decompression versus T-lift. The re-operation rates remain the same at 13% at 5-year follow-up. You do only decompression, 13% of patients will require a second surgery for progression listhesis. If you do a fusion, 13% of patients at 8 years will require an adjacent segment fusion. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem with any of these papers is they just focus on the presence of very important that joint site. If you lump everybody together, there's some patients benefit that are safe to do decompression alone. That, and it's much more... Um, that requires look. Dr. Abhay, you have done quite a bit of dynamic fusions and transition rods. Would you like to add a transition rod for the L3-4 segment to prevent ASD in near future? I would have loved to, but I can't because my next problem is the L5-S1 disc also. So it's, it's not going to help me to, uh, you know, save the L3-4 if the L5-S1 is poor. So I would just do a floating fusion here. I also want to point out, uh, even though these facets are coronally oriented, there's a massive hook on the sides. It's a claw facet. If you see all the, all the sag cuts, all the axial cuts that uh, Dr. Ayer has put up, they all claw down on the side. And that's another sign of covert instability. If you go do a CAT scan here, it'll look horrendous. So it'll encourage you to do a fusion. Dr. Vikas Gupte, you're counseling for such patients. Now, the house is divided. This patient has already met Abhay and Gautam both. One has said decompression, one has said fusion. He's confused. What's your counseling going to be? How do you involve patient in decision making? What are the complications you really list across in your consent form? Uh, I would do uh, decompression only here, uh, tubular decompression. And I will sound the patient that in future, things may progress. If it progresses, he may require, he may require a surgery. But point here is his paraspinal muscles or multipedus is not very good. So post-operatively, I will concentrate more on the physiotherapy, which will prevent its further progression. Dr. Ram, we have seen you performing fusions for degenerative for years already. What's your take in long-term outcome? 
for example, this patient 10 years ago has undergone a fusion. What was your consent then and has it now changed the consent and communication to the patient about outcome and post-operative issues in 5 year, 10 year follow-up? Consent is far more guarded today and I totally agree with that one statement, although I would also agree with Dr. Kuti that each patient is different. Patient live long enough, may need more 13% of them may need It's your counselling on If he's 60 year old, chance of having that is 75 year old. Very, very clear. Whatever you making them less unhappy for some time. Thank you, Dr. Abhay. So, uh, Dr. Ram, so the, so the message is very clear that now we are in an era. Spine is the only area where one surgery doesn't solve it all. We are, we are going to see adjacent segments, upper levels, lower levels, and that has to be taken into consideration while you're not only counseling the patient, communicating about it, but also in consent in today's scenario. If you're not mentioning about these problems, which are already mentioned in literature, you are probably not doing justice to the healthcare system. So now we are in an era where we have decompression group, we have open fusion group, we have a tubular decompression group. Uh, Umesh, what's your take on this? In this case, would you do a decompression alone? Am I still lift tubular or would you go and do an indirect decompression, which is your forte? Uh, means I would agree decompression alone is probably sufficient in this patient, but ob obviously it has to be done after uh, adequate counseling that there is a chance that the lipidosis may progress and the patient may need a uh, second surgery at some later date. Now, uh, the reason why the risk is probably higher in, the, in this case is what Dr. Abai has already told, it's a hydrated disc. There is already a small acute pseudobulge that is there protruding behind the vertebral body uh, and probably that is one of the reasons preserved hydrated disc with the preserved disc height and this is one of the reasons why it may progress despite the facets being coronal and despite the facets significant arthrosis already the facets appear to be used I, I mean I mean a CT may add more value in these cases whether there is a facet calcification and all those things but uh, Probably because of the facets, only because of the facet. If you don't look at the means, uh, that is one of the favorable signs where we can say decompression alone is sufficient. But if you look at the disc, probably there is a chance that it will progress further. So multiple points the panel has brought forward that while you are really subjecting these patients to fusion, just don't treat fusion as a blanket treatment for all patients of listhesis. There are various factors which can help you to do a decision making, the height of the disc, flexion extension x-rays, the coronal or sagittal alignment of the facets, the way facets are subluxating forward and whether this patient has axial back pain also or not and most importantly whether you have communicated it and taken a consent about the type of procedure that you are going to perform. Uh, so Dr. Omesh, is there a role of OLIF also in these single level uh, uh, listhesis patients where you can really jack it up and get a better indirect but, decompression? But again, again one of the important things that we look for OLIF is the facet joints and, and with this kind of arthrosed facet joint, before, before even considering only if I would do a CT scan in these cases, there is no instability. It, it means to say that the facets are already stabilized. Probably there is some amount of calcification. There is a severe hypertrophy, medial hypertrophy, supraarticular process hypertrophy is there. So unless we are able to distract and reduce this, unless we are confident of doing that in an OLIF, because it completely works on indirect decompression. So I, I wouldn't probably prefer OLIF as the first uh, uh, step. In this, I would still go ahead and probably do an MIRT lift rather than doing an OLIF. And, and maybe if the fac bilateral facet are arthrosed and if I may, my main aim is to reduce the listhesis anatomically, in those cases probably I would do a bilateral facetectomy and do a cantilever rather than just doing a lateral work. Right, Abhay, reduction or in situ, postlateral elderly patient, low demand? I mean, I'd end up doing a reduction. I wouldn't try hard, but it'll end up reducing and it'll get a good disc height. And on the point of OLIF, there's, it's like, a, you know, it's a salami slicing. Like when you can do it from the back, why do you want to do it from the front and the back? Because you can't do it front alone. Right. OLIF standalone is going to just give way. Right. So basically, OLIF, the OLIF hard sellers are selling two surgeries. And Dr. Qureshi, we are in an era of osteoporosis, 70-year-old female. Uh, postpone it to build up bone mass or you would just do it, treat osteoporosis simultaneously. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think you have to counsel the patient on both options. Um, if the pain is not tolerable, single level, uh, I generally, you know, robotic guidance allows me to put, I think it's osteopenia. I'd probably. 
Right, Dr. Gautam, you have been speaking about enhanced recovery as well. Dr. Ayer's word before he comes up, maybe you can tell us about your protocols of how to minimize the trauma to this patient and hope you have a talk already on it. Dr. Ayer, final word from you, how do we apply in practical sense the ERAS to such patients where we reduce the morbidity of such patients? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, again, all the things that were mentioned, I think the osteoporosis is a very important point. I think pre-treating as much as possible prior to surgery or fusing is critical. Um, and I think having a set anesthetic uh, plan is going to be important as well. Um, I think uh, for the panelists, there was a right answer here. So I, I did a tubular decompression for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned. He did great, but about three months after surgery, I got the dreaded, dreaded phone call, and this is what it looks like now. So I think, fortunately, he's consigned to that 13%. I mean, we injected him. He hasn't called back yet. But um, I, I'm not very optimistic anyways that, that this is something that will be able to avoid a T-lift very, very long. Rishi, you pick up the mic, any comment? Yeah, I just, I, I think it's a really interesting post-operative finding that the fluid that wasn't, that's before, now is present bilaterally and looks on the left side as form cyst. So I think what Dr. Nate, oh, yeah, there you go, large <laughs> cyst. Um, yeah, large so, cyst. Yeah. And so I think what Dr. Nene was saying before is really important that, you know, sometimes you can look at the facet organ. MRI and that sort without a CAT scan. So I, I CAT scan. Your patient has now done a decompression and has come to you with this. What's your next call on it? How do you tackle and break the news to the patient, and how do you take it forward from here? You have a patient decompression done three months ago, and now a facet cyst. You have counselled and taken a consent earlier, but how do you break the news and take it forward? I think uh, as a Vikas mentioned the counseling initially was very important that you should have to explain, explain to the patient that we are trying to do a less invasive surgery and uh, there is a small risk of this happening and if it so happens it can happen at any time during the course of uh, the next few years. It doesn't have to be within five years later or ten years later, it may be three months as this has happened. So uh, one most important thing that is there is that the complication when it occurs should not come as a surprise to you or your patient. If it comes as a surprise to the patient, then he's anyway he's unhappy, but he'll be extremely unhappy and start blaming you. So you should have a situation when all this has been explained to the patient, then they are much more ready to accept whatever has been. And you know, the counseling has to be, it is a shared decision. So if they've decided that they want to go ahead with this procedure, then probably they'll stick with you. Having said that, probably our situation in India is a dif little different from Dr. Courage's situation in the US where the patient comes right back to him. In majority of the patients, when this happens, they'll come back to me, I'll say, okay, take some anti-inflammatory, then they'll come to you. That's Rabbi, if you have did a fusion and you get the same patient having ASD within six months, is that a possibility? In six months developing ASD? Yeah, yeah, so like the famous professor said, you know, there are only two types of spine surgery in this world. One that converts leg pain to back pain and the other that converts back pain to leg pain. So my surgery would also convert his leg pain to back pain even if I had fused, but that would be adequately counseled. So ASD almost is a part of the natural history and there's already ASD there, you know. So I'm, I'm going to tell him, okay, I can't cure your back pain, I'm going to take care of your leg pain, your back pain is going to be there, your MRI will keep worsening, but uh, we'll take care of it. Thank you, Dr. Bhai. Thank you, panelists. I'll just summarize all the points here. Degenerative spondylolisthesis on one hand, potentially and inherently an unstable situation is not always unstable. It doesn't always require fusion as a blanket treatment. Patients with a collapsed disc height with poor coronally aligned facets are the ones where you can really think of doing only decompression. It is also a known way of treating such patients. Uh, consent and communication about problems is extremely important on day one so that surprises don't come to you later. Adjacent segment degeneration is also known to happen even in a wonderfully done fusion and when you do fusion the options of open fusion, MIST lift and OLIF are all options available at your hand which are again to be brought forward to the patient. Back to you Dr. Ayer where we can have our panelists coming up with the technique of what can be done in what manner. Dr. Ayer, thank you so much. I actually left the All right. So, yeah, so, you know, obviously we discussed all the different ways we could treat this problem. So we'll have uh, our panelists come up. The first uh, way to treat this would be an open decompression plus fusion. So, Dr. Zavir. So we just had an extensive de discussion on 
degenerative spondylolisthesis, a stable listhesis with a tall disc was the situation. And as was shown in this case, obviously, you know, decompression alone would have been a bad idea. And therefore, one must understand what does the patient want at the end of your surgery. At the end of this surgery today, patients want relief of your, their primary complaints, back pain, leg pain, functional limitation. They want absence of complications. They want minimum post-operative pain, early post-operative mobilization, a short hospital stay and an early return to activities of daily living. So if you have a case like this, as I said, a tall disc, what looks like stable facet joints, but there is a facet joint on the cyst on the right side and a severe stenosis. I think I would definitely go ahead here with a decompression and, and instrumented fusion. Now, what sort of a fusion should I do? Should I do a posterolateral fusion, open T lift, MIS T lift? And I'm going to really lay the can of worms open here by saying it really doesn't matter. Whatever you do, the results are exactly the same. Okay, if you do your surgery 